We've talked about human identity, but what about God's? Today we'll learn God's name and see how his identity comes to impact world history. Thanks for tuning in to The Bible Brief. We're excited to keep moving through the Bible with you as we continue our jog together. We've just left the book of Genesis, and in that book we formed a foundation for everything else that occurs in the Bible. Perhaps most importantly, on both our run and our jog through the Bible, we focused on the importance of two events. First was the fall of mankind in the garden, and second was the Abrahamic covenant. The fall expressed the basic problem of the Bible, the corruption of sin in the heart of mankind, and the Abrahamic covenant gave structure to the way in which God will set things right and bless the whole world. This would happen all through a promise woven through the whole Bible, the promise of a seed of the woman Eve, a descendant who would destroy evil forever. As we move forward in the Bible, we're going to have significant focus on the nation through whom God would bring this descendant, this ultimate promised one. He will be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he will come from Jacob's nation, Israel. In this episode, we'll be introduced to the nascent nation of Israel, who through coming to Egypt because of famine, will leave Egypt to go back to the land promised to Abraham, the land of Canaan. So let's get started. We begin the book of Exodus with a rehash of what has happened since Joseph saved the world from famine with God's help. As the second in command of Egypt, he helped lead the country to save grain during the years of plenty to have rations enough for the seven years of famine that would follow. Remember, it was in this context that Israel's family all came to Egypt to settle. Then, around 400 years pass. And Exodus tells us this in chapter 1. Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation eventually died. But the Israelites were fruitful, increased rapidly, multiplied, and became extremely numerous so that the land was filled with them. Said another way, the twelve sons of Israel expanded into the twelve tribes of Israel. Each of the sons had lots of babies, and in turn that generation did the same. This repeated until hundreds of years later, they became extremely numerous so that the land was filled with them. These twelve tribes, the peoples from each of Israel's twelve sons, would become the main way of dividing these many people for the remainder of the Bible. Twelve sons for twelve tribes. If you're interested in both the names and the character of each tribe, a good place to look is in Genesis 49, where Israel blesses each of his twelve sons. We couldn't cover it in this jog through, though, due to the constraints of time. Okay, so now we have a nation of twelve tribes that's extremely numerous and fills the land. Egypt now essentially houses a nation. It's a nation within a nation. The nation of Israel within the nation of Egypt. And then something happens. A new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. He said this to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and powerful than we are. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them, otherwise they will multiply further, and when war breaks out they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So the Egyptians assigned taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. The Egyptian pharaoh is evidently worried about the number of Israelites also called Hebrews. He sees that they are dominant in Egypt, and he's afraid that they may become uncontrollable. And not knowing Joseph, he doesn't respect the fact that one of the sons of Israel was responsible for the survival of Egypt in the first place. Not only does he oppress the Israelites in slavery, but he also commands infanticide of all the baby boys born to the Israelites. But as we know from our run-through, the baby boy Moses is spared by the Egyptian princess and he grows up in the household of Pharaoh. However, upon seeing the oppression of another Israelite slave, he murders the Egyptian oppressor before fleeing into the desert. It's in the desert that God shows himself to Moses, before commanding Moses to go back to Egypt to demand the release of the Israelites from their slavery. Now with our focus in this jog through on identity, I want to focus just briefly on the middle of this conversation between God and Moses, as God is commissioning Moses to go back to Pharaoh. In Exodus 3.13 and following, it says this, Then Moses asked God, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. 
This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the Israelites. The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered in every generation. Now this is the first time in the Bible when God reveals his preferred name to anyone. This name is often translated in some way to either Jehovah or Yahweh, but it's essentially four Hebrew letters that carry with them a somewhat complex meaning. In this passage, it's translated as, I am who I am. The emphasis, though, needs to be emphasized. God's name is a statement about God's identity, which is effectively, I am. Now, when people say that, they're talking about being or state. That is like, I am tired or I am hungry. I am followed by some modifier. This statement by God, however, is not about a shifting state. It's about a constant state. God is expressing his identity as the one who was, who is, who is to come, the one who simply exists, the one who has always and will always exist. Said a bit differently, God's name is an expression of his eternality. God's identity is the always present one, who is the God of all ages. This is how he wants to be remembered by all generations, that God is, I am. Okay, so back to the narrative. Moses goes back to Pharaoh and demands that he let the Israelites leave Egypt. But Pharaoh resists, and we have the ten plagues that we discussed in our run-through. But what we didn't discuss is that these plagues are effectively God's demonstration of his supremacy over the fake gods of Egypt. While the Bible doesn't detail this out, archaeologists have discovered evidence that the Egyptians had gods that corresponded to the plagues that the true God sent upon Egypt. In a sense, I am who I am was saying to these fake gods, you're not. These plagues culminate in the death of the firstborn of every house in the land of Egypt. And this should be seen as a response to the death of the firstborn that Pharaoh commanded of the Israelites in the beginning of the book of Exodus. God provides not just judgment with the plagues, but retribution for Pharaoh's actions against the Israelites. But remember, This plague did not simply exclude the Israelites. It demanded a response from them so that they could escape the plague. Maybe you remember that they had to put the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their homes in order for the plague to pass over their house. In our run-through, we connected this with the idea of substitution, that the lamb was a substitute in place of the firstborn of each home of the Israelites. But now I'm going to tell you that there's more to this event that from here on will be called the Passover. This Passover event was actually something that helped signify the beginning of the year in the Israelite calendar for future generations. It was on the 10th day of the first month of every year that God commanded this Passover meal be done. It consisted of a one-year-old male lamb prepared in a specific way, eaten as a feast to commemorate God's deliverance of the people from Egyptian slavery. Listen to this from Exodus 12. Keep this command permanently as a statute for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, you are to observe this ceremony. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? You are to reply, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, and he spared our homes. And the people kept this ceremonial meal generation after generation. This Passover marked the beginning of the formal sacrificial system in the nation of Israel, to which many other sacrifices would be added. But this one, the Passover meal, was the first, and it helped mark the beginning of each year. By killing a lamb, roasting it, and eating it on the same day in the same way each year, it would be hard to forget what God had done for the Israelites. It was at this same Passover meal, about 1,500 years later, that this meal would gain even more significance. A different kind of lamb, not a one-year-old from the flock, but a man from Nazareth would say these words to 12 Israelites. Listen to this from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. And Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, gave it to them, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. The Passover meal that would serve as a memorial for all generations of Israelites gained an even greater significance. Instead of an animal slain, a body was broken. God's lamb would be the substitute for every person in the world, and his blood applied to the doorpost of every heart that clings to him in faith. The Passover meal is the great memorial feast of the whole Bible. It announces salvation from slavery, and it reveals the very heart of God's identity. It's as if God shows something else behind the I am, so that we humans can see more of his character. Something like, I am the Savior. Which, not coincidentally, was Jesus' Hebrew name. Yeshua, meaning God saves. Join us next time as we see the nation of Israel in the wilderness. Egypt is far behind, and God has miraculously saved his people. But the road is hard and the wilderness is rough. And God proves himself not just a savior, but a provider as well. Tune in to hear a funny little account as God provides a new kind of bread from heaven about which the Israelites say, What is it? Thanks for listening to The Bible Brief. Have you donated to the Bible Literacy Foundation? We'd love for you to partner with us so that we can expand our reach and grow. Your support means more people will have access to the life-changing story and message of the Bible. The easy way to donate is to click the link in the show notes to this episode. Alternatively, you can go to our website, BibleLiteracyFoundation.com, and click Donate. Thank you for making this show possible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2022.